<clears throat> Next item on the agenda, item B, uh, New Edward County Schools 2012-13 uh, ready data assessment report appendix C, Dr. Markley. All right, I'm going to turn this over to uh, Ms. Karen Green, who heads up our testing department, who has put the report together. Uh, folks, I can't say enough good work about the, what our testing department does and the folks in instruction do in terms of helping get this data out and uh, to our schools. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. We're a little later this year because of the um, delay in the test scores. Normally, this would be in a November presentation. You have the packet, the booklet at your place, and what I want to do for this presentation is preview some of the district data that's at the beginning of the report. So we're going to talk a little bit about the curriculum timeline change and then talk about the new READY model because our accountability model now has changed. Then we're going to go into proficiency and growth and then talk about annual measurable objectives and then the individual school reports. I'll be talking basically about district-wide data for this presentation. This PowerPoint highlights some of the key features in the packet that you received. You have to go on to your agenda. The ready report. I'm sorry, oh, we were thank you. called it something we were physically we were packet. supposed to have. No, the PowerPoint just okay. highlights a few of the things in the ready report. Thank I you. Didn't want to pull up all 50 pages, so I was <laughs> trying to summarize. <coughs> so basically, we're going to look at district data, and then, um, of course, the report details has a school report card, if you will, for every school. Um, the change timeline began in 2009-10 when the State Board of Education approved the new standards. Previously, we've always called them the standard course of study for every curriculum area. Now we have common core state standards for math and English language arts, which we previously called reading. And also we adopted the essential standards for science and social studies, and those are state-based standards. So between 2010 and 2012, school districts worked um, to provide professional development for teachers. Um, content-specific professional development because the standards were much more rigorous and in some areas um, more content and pedagogy was required. Of course, when you develop a new curriculum, you have to develop new assessments. So starting in 2010, we had field item trials and pilot tests and things of that nature. Last year, we implemented new assessments and new curriculum in all subject areas for math, reading, social studies, and science. Districts are continuing to provide professional development. Um, lots of schools, in, in addition to participating in district-wide professional development, they've formed small professional learning communities at the school to become more um, involved and learn more detail about the content. The new accountability model is called the READY model. We used to call it the ABC model. Um, we started calling it that in 1996. And the ABC model really focused on basic skills, a basic education. The READY model really focuses on getting kids ready for a career in college. The model's a little bit different in some areas between elementary, middle, and high school. But for both areas, we do discuss proficiency and growth. And proficiency is the percentage of students that meet the standard or considered passing the test. Now, with the new curriculum and the new assessment, the standards have also been raised. So back when we first started testing in 1996, students only had to get about 33% of the test correct in order to be proficient or passing. And then in 2005 and 6, the standards changed again and the standards rose again. Um, and now, students, in order to be proficient on these assessments, have to get anywhere from 73% to about 82% of the items correct in order to be considered proficient. But we can't talk just about proficiency, we have to talk about growth because when you're looking at how students are doing, you have to really look at both facets. You know, are they achieving the standards? Are they meeting the accepted, ex expected standard? But then also, are they making progress? At some of our schools, we have students that may not be proficient 
may not have demonstrated that mastery that we wanted them to on the assessment. But then we have to look and see if the students are growing, if they're making progress. So progress and growth is an important um, facet of this accountability model. Then we also have the annual measurable objectives, the federal guidelines that, that require that we track groups of students to make sure that all student groups are making progress. And in grades three through eight, attendance is also a feature. And in high school, the graduation rate is a feature. And it's not just graduation rate for all students, it's graduation rate for all student groups. Now there are some under the new ready model that are new for this year and I've kind of color coded them. One of the new features to make sure that we're career and college ready is to have um, math course rigor. Making sure that we're graduating students that have taken rigorous math courses. And the measure here is successfully completing Algebra 2. We also administer the ACT to all of our juniors, and this happens statewide. It's a national test, reading, science, writing, mathematics. And then also for our graduates that are career concentrators, they take what's called a work keys assessment. It's an assessment to, to gauge career readiness in terms of communication skills, listening skills, reading, and writing skills. And then of course, graduation project is part of the ready model too. We don't do any calculations with that. That's why it's outside. It just has a little check mark. Districts are given an endorsement if they participate in graduation project. And we are happy to report that as a district, all of our high schools participate in the graduation project. This is just a little bit of a summary in terms of trends in what happens when we change the curriculum and of course change the assessment. We tend to get a dip. As I said before, in 1996, that was the beginning of the accountability model. Then in 2005-06, we implemented some new and more rigorous math standards and we had a dip. And then in 2007-08, we implemented more rigorous reading standards. Now take note that the standards were staggered. We didn't expect teachers to learn all new curricula and implement in one given year. They were staggered. But then in 12-13, we implemented all new curriculum and we saw an extreme dip. Now we also didn't have retest last year as well. You know, previously we have been administering a retest for students that weren't successful the first time. We did not implement retests last year because we didn't have any data to gauge whether or not the student was successful. So the also, during that time frame, the deficiency numbers also changed. They increased, correct? Yes, sir. Which would they have did. They increased. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so now the bar is even higher, and mm -hmm. it's as high as it's ever been. So the annual report con contains these features, and I'm going to discuss a few of them tonight. The performance composite for our district. The performance composite is the proficiency for all the tests put together for all of our students in the district. And our performance composite this baseline year was at 53%, which may sound low, and it's lower than our performance composite has been in the past, but for this baseline year with new assessments, new curriculum areas across the board. What we can do is compare ourselves to how the state is doing. And that's one of the things in the baseline year that we really try to look at. How are Let we? Let me ask a question. Yes, I, sir. I know you know this, this answer. I, I'm pretty sure I saw somewhere, you can tell me if this is wrong, that uh, our proficiency decrease has more to do with them increasing the level of the, the number of test questions answered correctly to achieve proficiency. And so if you were to actually look at the number of items scored correctly last year versus the number of items scored correctly this year, they would trend about the same. It was about, you had to pass about 48% of the questions last year to be a level three. 
and it's about 70% of the questions this year to be a level three. Correct, so, if, so, if, if you, so what percentage of our students who didn't achieve a level three last year would have achieved a level three this year if? The standards hadn't changed, we were about the same. We would have been about the same, which is commendable <laughs> for our teachers because the, the standards are so much more rigorous. The curriculum that they're teaching. Well, that's the point I'm making. Because a lot of the things you're saying is that you know we have to expect a dip, given the fact that teachers are presenting this entirely new curriculum. But that's actually a wash when you actually look at the, the data. If the state had kept the numbers required for proficiency the same, we would have expected the same level of proficiency. We wouldn't have seen that drop as Correct. much. Correct. Right. That's right. This just kind of gives you an overview of our test takers in grades three through eight. So for English language arts, which I probably will say reading at times, but it is called English language arts now, and math, our baseline proficiency compared to the state is above the state. Are we happy where we are? No, but this is a baseline. This gives us somewhere to start. Now one of the things that we have been doing at some of our schools where we know that the students haven't been as successful is under the direction of Dr. Smith and Instructional Services, they've been implementing a more rigorous in, um, instruction and assessment cycle and coaching. Um, her team has been coaching the teachers and working with them on using small instructional chunks and testing chunks to analyze where the students are and to make improvements more frequently. So that's one thing that we have in place this year that we have not had in the past. So for some of our target groups for English language arts, um, again, we're above the state, but we're not above the state with our, our black student group. That's an area that we're working on. Our economically disadvantaged students and our students with disabilities. The numbers are low. But again, for this baseline year, we're looking at where the state is. And for math, again, the trend is that we are above the state. Um, and are fairly competitive with most student groups. Our black student group did not do as well as the state. <coughs> and our students with disabilities did not do as well as the state. What, when you say economically disadvantaged, I noticed from the other slide we were at the top. Uh, Free and reduced lunch cash mm -hmm. is, is how we measure that. Okay, so that's yeah. that total. Yep. Mm -hmm. Okay. Compared to the total in the other systems mm -hmm. that we're mm -hmm. compared to. Okay. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and in science in grades five and eight, um, we are um, above the state. We are um, leading in grade five. We're a little behind um, Pender. And for our AIG students, in terms of proficiency, these are the percentages of students that were proficient on the math and reading assessments. Previously, we've had a lot of students that were identified as academically gifted that sometimes scored in the low level fours or high level threes. And so we've seen a, a dip, again, because that standard has been raised. Moving on to high school, um, this is just a sample of our test taker breakdown. Algebra one, geometry and algebra two now are referred to as math one, math two, and math three. They take more of an integrated approach. And we did well above the state in all three areas. I might point out that English two is a new tested area this past year. Previously, we've been testing in English one. Can I go back and ask you a question? 
Yes, sir. Back to your AIG slide. Yeah. Um, third to fifth grade, sixth to eighth grade, third to eighth grade. Mm -hmm. What's, I don't understand, you know, why it's, it's gapped. I mean, why mm -hmm. isn't it fifth to eighth or sixth to eighth? Instead of three to six. Well, it's three, yeah, to, three, five, three to five, six okay. to eight, because that's, three, okay. that's how our schools are set up. So I wanted to break it out by elementary and by middle, and then by all together. So what you're saying is the last, the last chart's a cumulative? Yes. Oh, okay. In grades three through eight. Okay. Yes. Thank you. But we wanted to provide that additional detail. Right. And typically for um, math and reading, for that's how the state reports it in grades three through eight. I might want to point out that normally we're usually running a close second to Pender County in biology and it's baffled me for a long time. Um, one of the th new things that the state is reporting is participation in biology and we met participation for biology by and large as a district. Um, what I will tell you about Pender County is a lot of their students do not take biology until they're seniors. So they did not even meet their participation rate for biology. So in as much as their number looks higher than ours, they didn't test all of their children. And in two years, participation is going to count against their proficiencies as well. So if these children didn't take the test, not only will they count against your participation, but we're gonna count them as not being, <coughs> passing the test, not being proficient. Because we do wanna encourage all students to test. And this is an EOC composite. Again, our black students aren't performing as well as we would like for them to. At, um, they are above the state. <clears throat> our economically disadvantaged students and our students with disabilities. Next year we'll be able to provide more trend data because we'll have la this year, last year's and this year's. But for baseline year, we felt strongly about the rank, especially against the state. Because our accountability model has changed because we really want children to be ready for career, the workforce, and college. Um, we do administer the ACT to all um, high school juniors, and um, I'm happy to report that 66.5% of our juniors met the UNC entrance requirements on their, on their ACT score. That's commendable, and that's as high school juniors. Some of the additional um, career and college readiness indicators that are new for high school, of course graduation rate isn't new, but the math course rigor, the percent of students that are graduating that successfully complete Algebra 2. And then of course the work keys assessment. And that's a national assessment that tests the soft skills, um, the math and the reading, listening and writing required to be successful in the workplace and of our graduates that are CTE concentrators. That means in, in a concentrator area such as health science or um, business, they will take this assessment. We didn't score as high as we would like to um, in that area and that's something we're trying to backwards map and make sure we identify the grades in which those skills are covered so we can do a better job of reaching the children and getting to them to where they need to be. Because this assessment isn't just about CTE. This is really a cumulative assessment that really involves um, math and reading as well. You're talking about the work keys assessment? Yes, ma'am. Is that also gonna be um, that per school? Like, are you also going to 
figure out per school what? Yes. Okay. And then, of course, the graduation rate. Over the past three years, even though we're just a tad under the state, we have increased by 11.5% on our overall graduation rate. Career and technical education also had, they also have end of course tests in high school and their district proficiency is 82 percent. Um, I think it's nice to note that they've earned 1,427 credentials <coughs> this year, which is almost double of the credentials that they had last year. Microsoft credentials, um, nursing assistant credentials, things of that nature almost doubled from, from where they were last year. And this is just a breakdown of where how we compared against some other districts and the state um, for some of our student groups. This is just another way to look at it. You know, even though some of our student groups are still behind the state or not where we want them to be, we have seen significant improvements um, with our LEP students, our students with disabilities, um, and some marginal improvement for our black and Hispanic students. We talked a little bit when we talked about the ready model about proficiency, passing, meeting that standard, and then also growth. So that's the other component. When you look at our schools as a whole, 77 percent of our schools met what the state expected to in terms of growth. Overall, 23 percent did not meet growth, but they may have met growth in, in spots, and that's what the individual school reports will point out. This is an overall for math and reading combined, but the school reports break it out in terms of math and or reading. How are you measuring growth? Because clearly you're not mis measuring it based on the new proficiencies. Well, we're fortunate in the state of North Carolina to contract that out to SAS, which is the largest statistical analysis software development company in the world. And um, what they've done is they look at where a child was on the previous year's test um, in position to where all the other children were, and they convert that score to what's called a normal curve equivalent. And so in as much as the test changed, they're able to take where they were on the previous assessment in terms of their position and compare to where they are on the new assessment in terms of their position. That's the first thing I've heard tonight that makes sense. <laughs> in terms of all of our studies, but uh, taking that a step further, how did SAS, or whomever was the statistician for this grant experiment, decide where to place their proficiency cutoff? And is that proficiency cutoff, is that supposed to reflect true proficiency, or was it a portion of participants under the curve? I mean, how did we decide that the cutoff was gonna be a 50%, because you're looking at it, it's roughly 50%, which is to say half the children in the state of North Carolina were not proficient at English, math, science, looking at the state data. Now, does that really mean that, and looking at the data from previous years, I think we agree that the, the test results were fairly similar. So if this is true proficiency, it looks bad this year, but it means that our students have been not proficient, about half of them across the state, for as long as we can remember. So one of two things is going on, either our students are not proficient and we've been fooling ourselves, or this new proficiency data doesn't really demonstrate proficiency. Well, as you know, I've spent a lot of years in the classroom teaching math and science, and I will tell you that the standards that they, the state has set now are more in alignment with where they need to be. But how they how they determine that? Did they tell anyone? I, I never saw anything where they determined where where the DPI published how they determined this the new proficiency standard. Well, what they do is they have to collect all the data first, and that's that was part of the delay. They have to collect all the data. They use multiple sources. They um, look at teacher prediction. T 
teachers have to predict how the students are going to do on, this, on the test, and that's one of the facets that they look at. Michonne, you want to add? Something? Yes, if I could also add. Um, teachers were invited this year to go to DPI during the summer and uh, actually establish the cut scores. Um, there were teachers across the state that were surveyed and asked to participate with this. I know that we did have some teachers within our district to participate with this as well. Um, and so they established the cut scores and then those cut scores went to the State Board of Education for their approval. And there were a couple, I think two or either three different leveling um, that were voted upon or reviewed and it was decided that we would go with the more rigorous standards, the more rigorous cuts, because it did represent a truer picture of what proficiency would be. And so when we can <coughs> compare ourselves to these national assessments, then you don't get the disparity that we've seen in the past where maybe North Carolina is 80% proficient, but on NAEP we're only 40% proficient. So this definitely does represent a realignment. I mean, I, I guess that sort of makes sense, except that uh, a little bit of it all just sounds arbitrary in a sense. I mean, you know. Um, they wanted more with the NAEP-like standards and the scores that looked more like and co were comparable to NAEP, the national, national assessment. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the, and the, the, they hired a bunch of what, psychometricians who are uh, high-end statisticians to come up and establish cut scores that would match up with those, with those mm -hmm. NAEP assessments that would be more that, closer to that. And the states, when they got those numbers, this was the numbers that the psychometricians originally presented. And honestly, the state was a little concerned because the numbers were so low. And they were looking at ways to mitigate this and make it and sort of ease into these standards. Like a three-year process. Yeah. yeah. And I, I know superintendent for basically said, if these are the numbers you're going to work with, let's take our baseline and we'll build off the baseline. And then we have the federal annual measurable objectives, and that's where we're making sure that we're monitoring all student groups. So in terms of, as a district, we met 97.5% um, of our, our targets. And these targets are different student groups, as well as graduation, and then overall attendance for grades three through eight. But it's not just proficiency, it's not just meeting that standard on the assessment, it's also participation. So if we don't test 95% of our children in each group, then that's counted against us. So we have to be good stewards and make sure that we're testing all children so that we can get results for all children. Just to know, the groups that you see up there, we benchmark ourselves against the districts that we border, and then we benchmark ourselves against the other <coughs> urban districts. Now the previous slide just showed the percent tested of these groups, is that right? No, sir, I mean, this, this represents in terms of the number of targets we had as a district, the number of student groups for math and reading, for both proficiency and participation, the percent that, that met okay. of these student groups. So out of our AMO targets, how many of those targets did we hit? We hit 97% of the targets. Mm -hmm. All of them except two. Which um, and the two we didn't meet, for grades three through eight, um, English language arts was the black student group. Now that's not to say that all black students aren't progressing, but as a whole, we didn't meet the target for that. We were very close, within a couple of points. And the same thing for grades three through eight in math. And AMO measures growth. A AMO measures growth. Well, what it does is, is for a certain, for each subgroup, it says you, this percentage of them have to be proficient. And if you don't, if you're not, if that group isn't at that proficiency level, then they don't meet the target. And so they establish, and it gets kind of complicated because for uh, Caucasian students, here's your, this may be your target. For Hispanic students, this might be your target. So they don't, each subgroup doesn't have the same target. They look at where you are, and then that target is based upon where that, where you should be at the end of a year. So growth is a good way to, con to And it changes every year because the thought is that you need to reduce the, um, percentage of students not proficient by 50% over a period of six years. So the target will even be raised next year. The bar is raised every year. And that concludes the district-wide summary of the new READY report. We do have um, the individual school reports 
um, for your review and I'll be happy to answer any other questions. This has been a difficult year for teachers. It's been a lot to learn, a lot to implement, higher standards, more rigorous curriculum, and new assessments. And do the students with disabilities still have get the accommodations for their tests? Yes, ma'am, they do. And mm -hmm. so um, at the high school level, were they done mainly with the computer this year, or did they have the pencil paper test? Uh, that's a good question. By and large, we still tested paper and pencil um, last year. Um, this year we're going to pilot some online testing for English too, especially because um, there's a written component and we'll have to mail that off and it takes longer to get the data back. So we're going to pilot some English two testing for high school this year. Um, now some of the students on some alternative assessments, um, for example the extend one where it's really a one-on-one -on -one, um, the teacher administers one-on-one -on -one with the student because these students have significant cognitive disabilities. It's actually a one-on-one -on -one situation, but then the teacher does the data input for DPI online. Any other comments, questions? There are no questions. We'll <clears throat> delve into this on our own some more, I'm sure. Feel free to call if you have any questions. My staff, I have a great staff of four, and um, you know we're always willing to serve. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. That's a lot of information. It's a lot of information to cover. Mm -hmm. Item nine on our agenda, under consensus items, item A, personnel, appendix F, Dr. Wilmers. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We request the board approve personnel matters as presented. Feel free to reject the retirement list. <laughs> <laughs> move for approval. Second. With, with reservations. With, with, with reservations. I want to say thank you very much for that approval. <laughs> <laughs> Any comments or questions? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Item B, budget amendments, uh, Mary Hazel Small. Are there any questions? I recommend the board's approval. Motion to approve. Move for approval. That's second. Second. <laughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Approved. Item. Item. Uh, 10 under old business. Item A, Presidential Youth Fitness Program Professional Development Sole Source Resolution Appendix H, Dawn Brinson. Request that the board approve the Presidential Fitness Program. No for approval. Second. Questions? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? Approved. Item B, Gifted Advisory Council Bylaws Appendix Q, Dale Kelsey Beckton. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Request approval with gifted advisory council bylaws. Move for approval. Second. Questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Item 11 under new business, item A, discovery education science textbook, sole source resolution appendix I, Dawn Brinson. Request that the board approve the discovery education Science textbook sole source resolution. Move for approval. Second. Okay. Questions? Uh, the only question I have, and again, it's, uh, hey Jessica. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't ask anything about you yet. Uh, you know, I, I have children in elementary school, and so I, I see that this it's, it's kind of a neat little online, you know, uh, e-book, e e-textbook, but it's not necessarily uh, aligned with the curriculum. I mean, have we not been able to find something that's more aligned? Because I know that the, the teachers are finding videos elsewhere to show the children, and they're making PowerPoint presentations, and so even though we're spending, you know, quite a bit of money on a resource, it's not being used as, as much as, you know, one that would be aligned with our curriculum. So we haven't found anything better. 
I will ask Kim Beers that it was her request. I'll let her speak to that. Hi, I'm Kim Bierstedt. I'm the K-12 science lead teacher and um, have been working on the implementation of the tech book. And um, as far as alignment, the Discovery Education folks did go in and go through the North Carolina Essential Standards and say this goes with this standard and this goes with this. There are some things in the tech book that are beyond what's in our standards because other states use it too. But you can go through and for each lesson in there, click on the essential standards that go with that lesson. So it, um, they have, it's not completely aligned with it, but it's correlated with it so that, you know, you can see whatever standard you're on, what you can use in there that goes with it. Okay, well, I, I'm just saying, I, I only know what the teachers are doing, mm -hmm. you know, and so, well, and if this and is so good, then maybe we need to tell our teachers how good it is because they're not using it the way you're, you're talking about it. And I know this because I, I have children. Well, and um, it, it is a, a tool like we wouldn't expect a teacher to use a textbook, a textbook and nothing but a textbook, say read through the textbook and answer the questions and we're going to take the test at the chapter, at the end of the chapter. And this is kind of like that. It's a resource for teachers to use, um, but it wouldn't be the sole source of education. So they would pull resources from the kits, the science kits, and other things like that. Um, I did pull some data for you today. Um, as of today, let me find where I have it written down. I think I left it over there. Um, Um, as of today, and this is from uh, the beginning of year-round school last year, we have had 795,571 uses of the tech book so far. That's logins, um, video segments shown, reading passages, um, assignments, assessments, any parts of it. Um, and I, I'm able to break that down into how much of each of those things it is. So um, teachers are using it. It took a little while to get teachers used to using it with the new standards last year on top of having a new tech book. It was a lot for teachers to handle. So um, we're really pushing in and doing some grassroots professional development with teachers, um, going in and meeting with small groups of teachers to help them see how to implement it. We had the folks from Discovery Ed come in and do demo lessons in the classroom. So they actually showed the teacher, this is what it looks like when you're teaching a class using the tech book with the students in the classroom. And um, so I think after we got that first year down last year of getting used to it and navigating it, um, teachers are more willing now to delve in, be able to embed it into their own lessons and use the pieces that will fit what they need. Have you gotten feedback from teachers on what they feel, if they feel like this has been a valuable resource for them? Mm -hmm. We've gotten some informal feedback and um, plan mm -hmm. on doing a, a survey of teachers. Um, and, and teachers are always sharing with me um, concerns that they have um, or things that they would like to see. And that's the great thing about Discovery Education is they are really open to ideas. They consider New Hanover County one of their premier districts using that and so they really listen to our needs and our feedback um, and that's a good thing about an online textbook is they can go and change it they can go and add things with a you know hardback textbook by the time you get it that's what it is and we can go in they can make changes they can make additions and it's a constantly changing um, dynamic tool to use that can be made to be used the way that we and the teachers need to use it well, maybe I would suggest we, we actually survey our teachers and find out if they can change it, what works, what doesn't work. And, you know, <laughs> one of the promises, if you will, of the Common Core is that since this is essentially a almost nationwide set of standards being implemented, that you would think going forward that things like Discovery, you know, tech book would try to be aligned with the standards that we're trying to teach. Um, so I'm not, I'm not necessarily opposed to this. I just think that we, we keep approving this year after year 
and uh, you know I, I see year after year how it's being used with students <coughs> and uh, my experience at least is that the teachers may, may not be all that happy with it because they're not using it as much as you might think. And, and that's something we could definitely survey to see, you know, how, how many teachers use it, what they use it. We did do a survey um, when we piloted it for K-8, um, not this last year, but the year before that, um, but have not done one for the first year of rollout. So that's definitely something we can collect data on. And given the, the required amount of time for the reading language arts and math, at the elementary level, how are you working to ensure that the teachers schedule science? I talked with one teacher and she said, well, once, one nine weeks I'm gonna do social studies and one nine weeks I'm gonna do science. And I think, well, how do you report that to the parents and, and are, they, are the students missing out? And so that's are a great you question. looking at schedules for and, and schedules, and I have looked at schedules, and, and at some schools there's 45 minutes for science, at some there's shorter times, different grade levels there's different. And so what we're really trying to stress to our teachers is to not teach in silos. When you're doing language arts, instead of just reading, you know, <coughs> instead of reading a story, read a science related story or a social studies related story. Integrate those subjects that aren't as heavily focused as math and reading. Incorporate them in your reading as well as when you're doing science, incorporate reading and writing and math in science. So instead of, okay, we're gonna stop now, stop math time and have science time, have the kids doing math, science, reading, social studies all day long. And that's where teachers are gonna need that kind of training and helping them to get it organized and coordinated and time to plan. Exactly, and, and um, Discovery Ed does some wonderful professional development. They've actually came last year and with our instructional coaches did a read, write, and think like a scientist um, training on using the tech book for writing and reading in the classroom. They've um, come and done several um, on how to incorporate in centers and things like that. So they're really open to helping us, um, you know, create professional development to meet the needs of our teachers and to um, help them um, integrate all the subjects better. Any other questions? I think we had a motion and a second, didn't we? Mm -hmm. Okay. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you very much. Item B, energy savings, consulting, contract addendum, number two, appendix K, Mr. Hintz. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, request that the board uh, approve the uh, reduction in the, uh, in the EDUCON contract by addendum number two. Move for approval. Second. Questions? I have a question. And, you know, first off, I want to say I do appreciate what this organization has done. I, mean, I think we last year saved something like a million dollars in mm -hmm. energy costs through natural gas and, and the other things. But my question is this. You know, I, I see that it says that EDUCON, I guess that's how you pronounce it. Will no longer employ the energy manager in the contract. Training will be provided by EDUCON through the terms of the contract. The monthly fee to EDUCON under the contract shall be reduced to $12,300 a month. And I go on to say that we're going to employ this energy manager. That, that's so, correct. So I'm, I'm asking, what are we paying twelve thousand three hundred dollars for? What are well, we getting for it? Well, it's the tra <coughs> it's the training, and they run the program. The way they run the program in every other district is that the energy manager is from the very beginning employed by the school district. We specifically ask them to employ the uh, energy manager for the first two years of this of this uh, program, so that we could see how that it worked and so that we wouldn't have to employ them ourselves until the very last year. The contract ends uh, this year at the end of June. It's a 36 month obligation that we entered into three years or two and a half years ago with EDUCON. And, <clears throat> and the amount, uh, this is just being reduced by the amount since we are now employing the energy manager that was there. So this just reduces the amount of the contract but it doesn't change the substance of the contract and they're still going through, um, still giving us the training, still giving us the support. They still come down uh, on, a, on a 
pretty much a weekly basis and, and work with us. Um, we're still using their statisticians and their, uh, their expertise um, and the uh, HVAC uh, technicians that they have available to us. All right, well, two things. To, uh, first thing, in answer to your thing, the contract that we have mm -hmm. implies that this is not the third year. It says the annual fee for the third year of the contract shall be adjusted accordingly. Now, the contract ends this uh, June. This is the third year. Well, I'm just, uh, you know, it, it, the implication by how it's written and what we have you would imply that there's another, there's another year to it. Year. So I will, I'll take your word for it, but I would, if we, whatever we pass, I would ask that uh, Mr. Bullard review that wording to assure that, that we have, we're not tying ourselves up for an additional year. That would be no, my first. We're not. I can go ahead and give you that assurance because I actually drafted this language. Okay. And the reason I put that in there is because uh, we talked about reducing the monthly fee, but the original contract was actually written in terms of an annual fee. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to make sure that it was clear that we were redu not just reducing the monthly fee, that had also resulted in a corresponding reduction in the annual fee. But we this is the third year of the and last and final year of the contract. Okay. We, we needed to address it as a monthly fee because we were prorating it. Right. We were breaking it down. And uh, another, well, another thing to keep in mind is that <clears throat> any uh, before Educon gets any fee, they have to demonstrate that they've saved us at least as much in energy cost as the fee that they're I, asking. I, I, under, I understood that, but I, I guess I wondered, you know, at, at, at what point in time have we reached a point where we have trained people to do what Educon does I mean do, is there ongoing I mean how to how to save money by installing certain types of lights certain types of on off switches uh, <coughs> you know at what point in time have we reached a point that our people should know this stuff well it's a it's a three year contract and and the contract ends um, in the 36 month it ends so yeah and and we're not renewing the contract Okay. Because we have we have uh, the knowledge, we have the expertise. There's still it's still ongoing at this point in time. So you're saying this is just a modification of the this, original this three year contract. This is a modification contract. of the original contract. They're just reducing the amount okay. that we are paying them. All right. I that's just what wanted, that's what this is for. I just wanted to be clear that that that's what we were doing. This was not some new no, agreement we're, not we're re entering into. No, we will not be renewing or or, extend, okay. or extending the contract. Although they they work with the with the people. They continue to work with us. We continue to use them as a resource and a sounding board, but we don't have a uh, contract with them, and we're not paying them uh, an annual fee for that for that service. After this year, right? They provide that as a, as a service to all of their yes. uh, all of their customers across the okay. state. Okay. All right. Thank you. Any other questions? <clears throat> all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. <clears throat> Thank you. Good questions, Mr. Higgins, because that clarifies some things. Item C, transit uh, easement agreement with the Cape Fear Public Transportation Authority at Hoggard High School, Appendix L, Bill Hance. Yes, Mr. Chairman, request that the um, easement be approved for uh, the transit authority. Move for approval. Second. Questions? We had some concerns with that agreement. Were they addressed? They were. They agreed to all the concerns that we, that we had. Well, that's, that's a good partner to work with then. <laughs> uh, <I th> <laughs> That's just setting us up for the next one. Yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> uh, any other questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Item D, public utility easement agreement with Cape Fear Public Utility Authority uh, at Eaton Elementary School, Appendix L, Bill Hans. Yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is on for uh, consideration by the board. <laughs> Uh, it was tabled at the, the last meeting, and um, the Public Utility Authority uh, and Mr. Bullard has spoken with their attorney, and he can address uh, the particulars, but they were not able to meet uh, all of our concerns. Haven't any of our concerns? I think they did meet a, a couple, addressed a couple of them. Then Mr. Bullard talk, can talk about the specific. Yeah, the... Um original agreement that they presented to us, we did make 
significant revisions to it, which they did agree to uh, prior to us bringing it to the board for the first time. But the specific uh, issues that were raised uh, at the, I believe it was October meeting, uh, we asked them to make some further revisions and propose some further revisions. And their attorney explained that they weren't able to agree to that because they felt like the, uh, the uh, reservation of rights for us to be able to place item, uh, construct things within the easement area would unreasonably interfere with their ability to maintain their water line. That's the reason their attorney gave for not being able to agree to, to uh, amend the easement any further. Is anyone here this evening from Keithford Public Utility Authority? What was your question? Is anyone here from the Public Utility Authority to answer questions we might have for them? So we, we had concerns that we asked them to address. They said that they were unwilling to address any of our concerns and neither did they send a representative to discuss that. Great. <coughs> Well, I'm just going to reiterate my concerns from the last meeting. Uh, we've already extended an easement along the Gordon Road, Cape Fear Public Utility Authority, which prevents us from putting any kind of uh, security fencing along that side of our property. Uh, they're asking us essentially to extend another easement along the entire length of the property going towards um, Ogden Park. And then, of course, there are easements in place along Ogden Park as well. So essentially we will be abdicating any control of the perimeter of a school property in its entirety if we sign this easement agreement. Uh, I, I frankly don't understand why we would do that and I don't understand why we would not be allowed and, and that's why I'd like to see some of the Cape Fear Public Utility Authority to place uh, fencing in an easement, uh, particularly one that's just for water uh, I guess the concern would be that a, a pipe would rupture and they'd have to repair it. Uh, I don't know how often that they're, they're having problems with water pipes. I mean, sewer pipes uh, have been some concerns, but how often does a new water pipe rupture? Uh, and why would we limit our ability to control ingress and egress from our schools, which is a safety concern? Uh, I was just over at Eaton, my children attend Eaton, and I, I did notice that there is a, uh, a private company directly across the street on the, in the area they're proposing an easement that has a fence 10 or 15 feet back from the road. Uh, I'd also like to know, did they go to that uh, storage company and, and ask them for potentially an easement, being that clearly that property is not being used and Clearly, there's some sort of easement, which is why they have their fence 15 feet back. Um, but again, you know, for safety concerns, we'd basically be giving up all rights to our property if we agree to this easement. Uh, I'm opposed to the easement unless <coughs> Cape Fear Public Utility Authority can give me some overwhelming reason why we should consider it. And as I don't see anyone here from the Public Utility Authority who's present at our meeting to discuss this issue. Uh, I say we either vote it down or we can table it again until such time as someone from the Public Utility Authority would like to come speak with us. Ms. Chance, do you have a recommendation there as far as <coughs> what they might be willing to do to address Dr. Hickey's concerns? I, <clears throat> we've addressed it with them and Mr. Bullard has spoken with their attorney. I doubt that, my opinion is I doubt that they will make any additional changes. Whether or not they would send someone here, we can certainly request um, that uh, a representative attend the next board meeting uh, to address uh, our concerns or the board's concerns about the easement. Um, whether or not they will accede to that request, I don't know, but we can certainly make that request. Well, if we table this or we'll just vote it down, then what's the next step uh, as far as the, uh, the public utility? It's, it's the, we can ask and see if they if will come. If you vote it down, they got a couple options. They either have to find a new, a new route for their water line or they could begin condemnation procedures. Which would be no different than agreeing to the easement because essentially if we agree to this easement, we can't use the property. I think if we have concerns, I, I don't think it's unreasonable to, to ask someone from the utility to come here and answer our questions. Well, <coughs> I, mean, I don't understand what the concern is. 
I mean, easement, waterline easements run in front of everybody's property, down everybody's property. I mean, uh, they're just they're running water to Ogden Park. And I, I guess, you know, my understanding, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, it was that we could not construct any permanent structure on top of the easement. Mm -hmm. I think we discussed, was it, did they say we could not put a fence on it? They, they no, consider. I, I'm, I'm asking Mr. Bullock. Well, I'm answering because it's in the contract. So if you read the contract, it says we I, cannot I, put a I, fence. I, I, it says we cannot put any permanent structure on it. Including a fence. Well, it doesn't use those exact terms. I mean, it says, it says that they can put the water line in under the ground and we can't do anything that unreasonably interferes with that. Okay. Uh, now, the typical interpretation of that would be if you put something on top of it that blocks their access to it, then you're interfering with it. We did specifically reserve the right to um, install driveways across the easement area uh, and it says if they have to get to their water pipe and dig up our driveway, they have to pay to replace the driveway. Um, and we also reserve the right to uh, <clears throat> use the easement area for parking areas, drainage, or buffer areas, and also to plant and maintain shallow rooted ground cover, so small bushes, grass, things like that. Um, but you couldn't plant trees. Um, and my interpretation would be that you couldn't plant in, you couldn't build any other improvements other than a driveway um, because that would be interpreted as interfering with their access to the water pipe. All right, Mr. Bullard, if you look at page three, top of the page, uh, Arabic numeral one, uh, Granter, New Hanover County Schools, should have place, construct, deposit, leave, permit to be or remain on with or over the easement area, any construction materials, metals, lumber, trees, berms, water bodies, rubbish, refuse, fences, structures, buildings, or other obstructions. So, as I pointed out, they specifically mentioned in the contract that we are unable to place a fence. Can I cut to the chase and offer a counter vote to table this until we can see if see if PUA will come and talk to us. Am I allowed to do that? Sure. What? I'm sorry, I was reading. Um, I'd like to vote to table okay. this and ask, see if, the, see if someone from the CFPUA can come and talk to us. Okay. I think it's what we did last time. <coughs> the table, it said we have a motion to table. Mm -hmm. I'll second that motion. Any comments or questions on that? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Opposed? No. So we'll table it, Mr. Hans, and uh, we'll, we'll make a request on the be here at our January meeting. And Mr. Hans, in, in the meantime, uh, would you ask the Public Utility Authority to remove the two large tractors uh, that are on our property since they don't have an easement? Uh, again, it's a, it's a public school. It's not a tractor parking lot. They've been there since they completed work on the uh, Gordon Road a couple of months ago. Okay, item E, Murrayville Elementary School lease, appendix N, Mr. Hans. <coughs> yes, Mr. Chairman. Uh, request that the board approve the uh, Murrayville Elementary School lease. Move for approval. Second. Questions? Those in favor, please say aye. One second, Mr. Hans. I actually am in favor of this. I, think I, I said this last time. I love this idea of a public, you know, private partnership. The one question I have, and I read the contract, it doesn't stipulate when construction is supposed to begin, when it's supposed to end. I mean, we, this is a five year lease. My only problem with it is that, you know, should this, and organization not have the funds to proceed with this plan, uh, at wh what point does the contract then void, you know, if, if we want to use the property for some other purpose? Well, we would, it, it's a, if we enter into it, it's got a five-year lease on it. There's, there are terms to, to uh, terminate it, but uh, they would have it. The 
there's no stipulation in there about when they have to begin the construction. So they could begin it two years down the road. Yeah, I'm certain they'll probably stuff. begin it yeah, once they've raised the stuff. funds and yeah. it'll be a fundraising yeah. process. Yeah. Where they are in that process, I don't know at this time, but we can, uh, we can certainly query them and find out if they have a potential schedule in place uh, for that and bring that information back to you. What do you think, Mr. Bullard? Should we put something in there? I mean, you know, not that any, not that we have any use for the property in the next five years, but say they they don't have money for it in three years from now, and nothing's happened, and we want to use it for something, would we then be bound by this agreement? I, I think that'd be a good idea. I was looking to see if there was a provision in there that said if they abandon the property, the lease ends. Um, not seeing it now, so that uh, so if it's not in there, I'll be glad to add that. So if the board wants to approve it with that provision being added, the board can do that. You say want, what, but you would need to specify what, what time frame you're talking about. How soon do you want to require construction to begin, and when do you want to require it to be finished? I mean, I think it would be reasonable and give them two years to start and three years to finish, but yeah, I would, hate, would, be, I would hate to think four years from now they haven't touched the ground and we, we can't use it either. That would be reasonable, I would think, is to construction started <coughs> excuse me by the third year so that, that can be added to the contract but mr. Bullard we can approve it but I <coughs> any other comments questions all those in favor please say aye aye, aye. opposed it's approved item F 2014-15 curriculum course guide additions and deletions appendix O Dale Kelsey Becker thank you mr. chair request approval of the additions and deletions that came about due to state changes as well as courses that were recommended by schools. Move for approval. Second. Second. Questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Item G, Legal Claim Settlement, Appendix P. Mr. Bogler. Uh, as you recall, uh, or those of you who were on the board at the time, um, there were leaks at the Murrayville and Anderson Elementary Schools on the sloped roofs starting about as soon as the schools opened. Um, the operations department in connection with, um, with me and another outside attorney that we engaged uh, investigated uh, asserted claims against various uh, involved parties including the general contractor and the roofing subcontractor, the architect and engineering company. That, result, uh, that resulted in a settlement against those parties, uh, which was reported in your September 6, 2011 open meeting minutes. Uh, that settlement uh, left open claims against the manufacturer of the roof shingles, which we believe were responsible, for, at least partially, for causing the leaks. It was GAF Corporation. Uh, since that time, we've uh, had negotiations with GAF and did enter into a settlement with the board's prior approval in the sum of $10,000 to resolve the pending claims against GAF. The open meetings law requires the terms to be reported in your open session minutes, so the purpose of this is just to ask that the board uh, direct that, that the terms be reported in its open session minutes. Move for approval. Second. <coughs> Comments, questions? <coughs> All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It's approved. Thank you. Item H, uh, resolution to the General Assembly, Appendix R. Uh, myself, uh, as you know, last week, well, let me start off by saying uh, last week I had a nice visit with the League of Women Voters, enjoyed our, our time together. Um, and at the end of that meeting, I was given a copy of the NCAE resolution uh, that wanted us to look at, and I told them I'd be more than happy to bring that to our school board, because uh, I think we all have expressed concerns <clears throat> in previous meetings uh, with various aspects of, uh, whether it be the 25% uh, situation that, that uh, we've been working with Dr. Wilmers <coughs> on trying to come up with a uh, solution there, the, uh, well, other things that, that uh, we had concerns about uh, pertaining to the, uh, General Assembly and, and what was passed there. Uh, I sent the resolution to Mr. Bullard and asked him to look at it. And uh, since then, I think we all have seen the email from the North Carolina School Boards Association. Did everybody see that from Leanne Winter mm -hmm. there? Um, 
uh, encouraging school boards not to take action uh, on the NCAE uh, resolution simply because, uh, well, they, according to them, there were some factual errors, uh, plus the General Assembly, by the time they go back in session, this, uh, you know, mm -hmm. she just said now's not the time. Uh, and also, as you read in the email from the North Carolina School Boards Association, that they themselves are working on a resolution. Uh, for school boards across the state to consider because uh, there are many school boards that have great concerns uh, about uh, what is taking place. But still, I wanted to get it on our agenda so that we can discuss it because uh, I know we all have expressed concerns uh, about this. Uh, you know, there are quite a few of us have children in the public schools. Some of us are former school teachers ourselves, so we can relate uh, to, to what is taking place. I asked Mr. Bullard, I don't have the original resolution here, Mr. Bullard, but I believe the one we have on our agenda is the, the one you came up with. That's correct. Based upon uh, that, uh, let me get it there. Uh, it's a bit of a compromise between both the uh, school boards and the, uh, the, the NCAE resolution. Yeah, it, it's a, that's a, the way I look at it, it's kind of a compromise because there were some things in the other one that uh, that the NCAE put out. No offense to the NCAE, but some of those were uh, questionable as far as accuracy. I'll put it that way. Brought out by the school boards association. Uh, so I wanted to put this on here tonight. I, I think that uh, I I certainly have no problem with us taking a stand as to our beliefs uh, in wanting to support. Uh, you know, our New Hanover County teachers. Would y'all like me to read this to see uh, and then yeah. look at it point by point? Sure. Okay. Uh, it's a resolution before the New Hanover County Board of Education regarding changes to teacher employment law, December 3rd, 2013. Whereas the Appropriations Act of 2013, and I'm just going to skip all the numbers here, uh, include legislation that requires the school boards to offer four year contracts and bonuses to 25% of its teachers. Um, should that, Dr. Wilmer's state with three years employment or more, wasn't that specified in the, uh, in what they said? Um, yes, probably would be a good idea, yeah. I mean, that's what the General Assembly said, that's wasn't it, three said. years of, I just had to notice that's not in here. Um, but anyway, it all for four year contracts and bonuses to 25% of its teachers. But that's not really true. It would have to be, the other would have to be included for that to be accurate. Uh, and as whereas school districts are finding it difficult to select a method of determining who qualifies for the four-year contract offer, and whereas school boards value their teachers and believe them to be deserving of adequate and equitable compensation, and whereas teachers have received only a 1.12% state salary increase once out of the past five years, resulting in a greater need by school districts to increase recruitment and retention of teachers. And whereas the Appropriations Act of 2013 cut funding for classroom teachers, teacher assistants, textbooks, instructional materials, and limited English proficiency while continuing the elimination of funding for mentor pay and professional development. Now therefore be it resolved that the New Hanover County Board of Education request that the General Assembly allow it to retain its prorated share of the $10 million allocated for the 25% contract to be used for alternative pay or compensation for additional duties such as mentoring or leadership roles. And now therefore be it resolved further that the New Hanover County Board of Education urges the North Carolina General <coughs> Assembly to repeal the 25% contract and develop a more effective long-term compensation plan for teachers tied to career paths with input from the education and business community. So that's the resolution uh, before the board. Comments? Dr. Markley, can you, can you refresh my memory? When, um, what is the timeline on this 25% rule? <coughs> when you looking at our timeline, we're in the pro you will approve the process. Uh, we're, we'll gather the data. I think in January is when we're, we're going to have the initial list ready. Uh, teachers have to, the bottom line, teachers have to accept it by June 30th. Uh, so this is a resolution that's more symbolic than in terms of anything else because reality is the short session doesn't start till May. So you could send this to legislators, but effectively it's not going to be there. It's, it's not, 
it, they're not going to change it within, in, within a month. But so you'd be taking a symbolic action as opposed to potential, uh, instead of asking them to really obligate themselves to something. But it may be symbolic, but you know, we keep talking about if they don't want to change what they did as far as the 25%, then the local control should allow <laughs> us the flexibility to determine and let our teachers decide how that money would be yeah. split up. You know what I was thinking, and this is sort of, uh, well, if you believe in serendipity, uh, Lisa sent this an article today talking about how... Uh, Stacked ranking. I'm sorry? Stacked ranking. Yes, okay. But it started out Microsoft, oh, yeah. and they were using you know, these, these metrics. And uh, basically, Microsoft doesn't use that anymore because uh, they found it hindered collaboration. And, uh, and that set me to thinking, well, maybe the New Hanover Board of Education has just been lazy because we picked a really sort of straightforward, easy way of picking our top 25% of teachers. And rather than trying to be sort of innovative, and we can pick the top 25% of teachers any way we want. So we could come up with a metric that rewarded collaboration, that rewarded mentoring. We could say that in New Hanover County, we think that mentoring is very important, that collaboration is very important, and we can set that as our highest standard on our metric. I mean, the reality is one of the, one of the reasons that the School Board Association uh, was opposed to us passing this type of resolution was because in their conversations with legislators, the legislators expressed to them that, you know, you, you keep saying teachers aren't making enough money, and here we are offering to pay them more money and you're turning around and saying, but we don't want that. Uh, and then of course, Mr. Hayes is bringing up a local control issue. Um, you know, I'll do whatever the board wants to do, but I just thought that, you know, if you wanna maintain a local control issue and you wanna reward things like collaboration and mentoring, and we could come up with a metric that does all of that and in terms of you know, I would say the General Assembly kind of took the easy way out and sort of, on the one hand, foisted this upon local boards of education. But we can use this as an opportunity to come up with something special. But, you know, it's up to you guys. Well, the, cons the concern is that the 25%, though, is a one-time deal. If we had a 25% every year to use in some kind of collaboration pool, then creating that process really makes a lot of sense. This 25% pool, in reality, from the legislature, was simply a bribe to drop tenure from some teachers. But, and, and they only funded it for what, one year? Well, they, you, they, they only, you only pick the 25% for one year. Mm -hmm. And that 25% gets the money over the next four okay, years. Okay, so that, that's. But there's no guarantee that the money's going to be there for four years? Or? Well, the budget actually only includes money for next year because it's, it's a biennium budget. So the first year you pick your 25%, then, and the second year of the budget, 25%, they get that $500. Now they'll have to put the money into the next budget they create in the next long session. And the question becomes, if you write a contract and you say, all right, here's your new four year contract, you're getting this, this money, and the state for some reason doesn't fund it, then, then the, local, the local unit's on the hook for that, uh, for that funding. Because the contract says you're gonna pay them, it doesn't say from what source. And who writes the contract? We do. But there's a model contract that's being worked on now. And Derek, I mean, Dr. Mark, we kind of took my point. But I mean, I think that you raise a really good point. That I mean, I I think it would be a great idea to be innovative and to and to address this. What is said in, in the in the resolution coming up with um, mentoring um, and leadership compensation, um, which is exactly what we want. But with funding for one year, how effective can we be? Um, I have no problem passing this and looking at that um, if, to see if we can do that, to see if we can do it given the fact that we know we can only do it for one year, 100% know that we can do it for one year. We may be able to do it for more than that, but um, maybe look to see if we can be innovative. I think that's a very good idea. I think Ms. Eastead makes some very good points that <clears throat> I have no problem with, with passing this tonight with the understanding that uh, there's still some flexibility in here as what we could do locally. 
Uh, I know I personally have been in contact with several representatives in the last week uh, and told them what we were considering. That because uh, well, it's just a very awkward position for us because we're not really sure here. Really, I, I know Murray Middle School, for example, voted. The teachers down there said they don't want the 25 percent would not accept that. So, is there any way that we could include in here to let? locally the prorated share of the money that we would receive be a local decision and let teachers make that decision. I, I mean if we're for I think we've already discussed that mm -hmm. and the state law is very clear it. there's there is no flexibility. Yeah but it's there's a resolution it, I mean I mean it, I'm not uh, opposed I don't get me wrong. I support the resolution. Mm -hmm. I'm just simply saying that all this talk about implementing ideas and th I mean whatever money comes down is going to come down under the, the state Budget Act, and we'll have to do whatever they say we should we have to do, uh, and you know whether we like it or not, at least for one year. Um, well, we'll enforce the law as we're required to, but I think right. the resolution at least lets folks know that you're not. Oh, I agree. It's right. as I said, it's it's a symbolic gesture. We're not going to break the law, but we're not happy with the law. And right. if, if enough boards across the state follow suit, then I think it would bring some pressure to bear. It might bring some pressure, but it's Dr. And they could, Markley, they could change Dr. Markley said, you know, how, how fast is the legislature? I mean, they, they, they did this. You know, how inclined are they going to be to, to back off of it in, in the short session? But, you know, whether they do or don't, at least we have gone on record mm -hmm. as saying to, to the members of the state legislature and our delegation mm -hmm. that we don't agree with mm -hmm. it. Well, it's, it's just give us wiggle room. Give us the ability to be innovative. Give us the ability to say, okay, um, you know, let us, let us develop mentors. Let us develop leaders and let us pay them. And then, as we said here, develop a long-term compensation plan for everybody, um, which seems a lot more fair. Well, I think we could send a message by passing this. And as you stated, Mr. Higgins, it's might not do that much this year, but in the future, particularly if other school boards across the state, if they were also to get on board, I think it uh, could be beneficial. And I think it certainly voices support uh, that we have. Uh, well, if it gets out, we have done this, so mm -hmm. you might join us. Well, I think so. Mm -hmm. uh, well, red needs to show up everywhere, so these other counties across the state to get those school boards <laughs> to, uh, to go. Hayes, I, I'm just curious. Um, you, you stated that the North Carolina School Board Association was drafting a resolution? Was that right. A, the Leanne Winter, I uh, forget her official title. Uh, governmental relations. Governmental relations like person. Whatever. She sent an email out encouraging school boards not to pass the NCAE resolution. And oh. then she said that the, I don't know if it's the same email or another email where she said that okay. the School Board Association was working on a resolution which I have no problems with. We can pass this, and then if we like theirs, we can pass theirs too. Okay. Mm -hmm. that's, that's or make changes if we want to in theirs. I, I we think wanted to, to wait and see what you know if there were if that was in the works. We wanted to wait and see what what their. I think she's like. afraid we're going to irritate the legislature. Mm -hmm. But I that's the bottom line: is there has been um, concern. I'll put it that way. You you saw what happened last year in the general assembly with what almost happened as far as school boards losing control of their school buildings, their facilities, everything, due to the situation in Wake County between the county commissioners and the school board. That's what was driving that. So and I really don't care what they do in Wake County. If they want to do that, fine. But when they come and do it for the, to the rest of the state, and you had a county where we, we don't have control of our buildings and so forth, uh, but they backed off on that. But there is a sentiment uh, in, certain quarters, I'll put it that way, to be nice, um, where school boards have to, a lot of them are saying they have to be very careful of what might be coming down. Well, you know, whatever. I, think I don't want to have to worry about that. That's right. I don't want to have to worry about a potential power play That's and right. keep my mouth shut. I'm sorry. No, I think we, what we have to decide is what we think is right for us here in New Hanover County, and then we stand on that. Mm -hmm. And certainly uh, we've heard. I offer yeah. a friendly amendment. Pardon? Might I offer a friendly amendment? A friendly amendment? Yes. Friendly. Friendly. As opposed to hostile. Okay. You want to take hostile takeover? Do you think this one's hostile or? <laughs> well, the one I'm offering is friendly. I'm not, I'm not commenting on this one. 
<laughs> Let's hear your friendly <laughs> amendment. Uh, he's got a PS here. Uh, the X and O's. Actually, I'm sorry, actually, on the second resolved motion, I would, I would uh, again, not to be as belligerent as Mr. Hayes has been with this one. Well, uh, I just don't like to be. <laughs> just I don't like for, for other counties and, and other entities to think they're going to in, intimidate no, us know, down here for what, we're, what we want to stand for. So second resolved, it came, came off the screen, actually, so now I can't see it. The so second resolved? Who can uh, do the this? last one? Right, okay. Yeah. yeah. Can we strike the New York County Board of Education urges North Carolina Generally Assembly, then strike to repeal the 25% contract? So, so this to say, uh, to develop, instead of to repeal, to develop a more effective long-term compensation plan for teachers, and I would strike tied to career paths, and I would teachers with input from the education and business community. But that just leaves us right where we're at right now. Mm -hmm. Do what now? That leaves us, I mean, if you strike that, that leaves us right where we're at right now. I think we've got to, if we don't like the 25% rule, we need to say yeah. it needs to be repealed. Yeah. Uh, I think it's. Yeah. Would you call that the nice amendment? Uh, friendly. friendly. Excuse me, friendly. Okay. That's I mean, too friendly. I think that would express our discomfort with their policy without, you know, overtly attacking demanding. or demanding demanding something that's not going to happen anyway. We didn't demand. We urged. We're urging. We're not demanding. All right, we can tilt the windmills if you like. <laughs> Don Quixote. No, I, I agree with Mr. Higgins. I, I'd like to leave it in there that we're urging them to repeal it. All right, that's fine. Uh, do away with it. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's what we're saying. We, we All, right. Want to All right, motion to approve. Second. Any other comments or questions? All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? It is approved. And I guess we'll get that off on our nice paper and so forth. And we'll have the official seal on paper. Okay. Hopefully when that goes up and we'll decide who all we're going to send it to, that uh, we can get some action from some other school boards around the state uh, to follow suit. Item 12, call to the audience, non-agenda items. Uh, Caitlin Durkin. I was concerned about being the second call to the audience, but it couldn't have worked out any better with that nice segue. Um, my name is Caitlin Durkin, and I'm the instructional coach at Ogden Elementary School and also my school's Teacher of the Year. I'm speaking tonight for several purposes. The first is to clear up some confusion among our state leaders who have said that they have not heard any feedback from educators on the recent changes in education. I know this is not the case since I have personally written letters to the governor as well as our local representatives and I know my colleagues have done the same. Since we are not being heard, I reach out to you as our elected officials and our lifeline to the State Board of Education and ask you to be our voice. I ask that you support us and let officials in Raleigh know that we do not believe they are putting the students' best interests at the forefront of all their decisions. I'm very proud to work at Ogden Elementary School where I work with the most dedicated and passionate teachers. We have always put our students' needs first, and I believe our reputation speaks for itself. In order to be an effective teacher, it is necessary to stay abreast of current research and continue to educate ourselves on best practices to ensure our students' individual needs are met. A master's degree is not mandated in North Carolina, and neither is national board certification. With that said, over half of our teachers at Ogden have either received their master's degree, are working on one, or received their national board certification. I'm very proud of my degree, and I know that it has made me an even more effective teacher. Please let our state leaders know that taking away the pay incentive for a master's degree will discourage teachers from putting in their hard-earned money and limited time for continual education. This decision is not in the best interest of our students. I love working in New Hanover County Schools because every teacher I encounter believes in public education and what it represents. I've spent many sleepless nights worrying about the direction we are headed in and the message that is being sent to teachers and students. I'm concerned that awarding the top 25% of teachers a raise and taking away tenure will discourage teachers from collaborating and sharing ideas and their successfully implemented lessons. The criteria for the top 25% is unclear and unjust. Personally, our stagnant and decreasing salaries have put a strain on my family financially, so I understand why this monetary incentive would be enticing, but it's not guaranteed. 
We need to work on making funding for education a priority and use the limited resources to treat teachers as professionals and provide them with the materials and time to do what they do best, teach and make a difference. According to the 2011-2012 North Carolina Teacher Effectiveness data, there was less than 3% of teachers who received a rating of below proficient in any of the five teaching standards. It seems to me the focus needs to be on encouraging our effective teachers and giving them an incentive to stay in education. Again, you are our voice and our lifeline to the State Board of Education in Raleigh. It must be incredibly difficult to be in your seats, and I know you too have spent time worrying about the direction our state is heading in. Perhaps of creating a teacher advisory board for our district, much like the team that Governor McCrory has named, will allow us to put our heads together to come up with solutions to our current problems and ensure they have our students' best interests at heart. Recently, the negative media attention has distracted us from our common goals, and together we can put new Hanover County schools on the news for the right reasons. Thank you all for what you do and for allowing me to speak tonight about one of my biggest passions, education. Thank you. Since you said something nice about the board, we we're going to let that continue. We're just going to just roll on. Uh, next speaker, Nikki uh, Nikki Strawn. I wrote this prior to hearing the resolution. I'm happy to hear the resolution. My name is Nikki Strawn. I am the Spanish and health PE teacher at Wilmington Early College High School. I am a North Carolina teaching fellow and a UNCW graduate. I was educated of the year for my school last year. I'm here to address the Board of Education on the current state of being a teacher in New Hanover County. I arguably entered the profession in one of the worst years possible. I began my teaching career in 2008 amidst the economic collapse and the North Carolina state pay freeze. Here I am, five years later, getting paid $50 less than I did in 2008. I have witnessed over a dozen highly qualified friends and colleagues throw in the towel and quit the profession due to overcrowded and underfunded classrooms. What once used to be a zero to two year pay bracket has conveniently increased each year to follow me to what is now a zero to five year pay bracket, so county hopping for better pay will not even work for me. But wait, I could always go back to school and get my masters. Oh wait, that's right. Teachers in North Carolina will no longer go back will no longer get paid for holding a higher degree of education. But there is good news, right? This year I'm up for tenure. Oh wait, the state has mandated to modify tenure policies. So unless I'm selected as a top 25% of my school, no tenure for me. And if I am selected, how can I in good conscience look at all my other hardworking colleagues in my school who are in the same sink and ship and tell them I deserve it more? So I ask you, Board of Education, what incentive do I have to stay? What positive news do you have for teachers? What are you doing to help increase teacher morale? What incentives are being implemented to make sure that New Hanover County Public Schools have the best teachers for our children? Instead of focusing your agenda and Board of, Educa Board of Education meetings on how to meet the criteria for a law that you know is outrageous, a law you know teachers do not support, a law you know schools have signed petitions to opt out of, a law you know teachers have broken board policy to protest, and a law that you know needs to be changed, why not focus your agenda and Board of Education meetings on finding incentives for teachers to stay in this county to teach? If county commissioners can find money for banks and corporations to stay in Wilmington, certainly you can ask those same commissioners whom you meet with regularly to throw in some incentives for us teachers. Teachers need someone to stand up for them as we are silenced and paralyzed by an educational system that is controlled not by educators but by politicians. I hope to one day witness the paradigm shift in education where teachers and students lead the profession and not politicians and elected officials. But until then, you, our elected officials, are our only hope for change. Thank you. Next speaker is Alan Sandrin. Alan Sandrin. Hello and welcome for the opportunity to speak. I was um, 
I taught five years in the county before I was completely defeated by the New Hanover County School System and quit. Anything I say would be completely redundant. You guys all hit the nail on the head. I guess I just want to thank you all for coming together and being supportive and giving me more hope than what our Board of Education gives me. If I could just encourage you next election to get people on our board that have actually taught and been on school administrations. Um, thank you. Next item on the agenda, item 13, correspondence. Any correspondence, any board members would like to share? Under announcements, the next regular meeting of the Univer County Board of Education will, meet on, will be held on Tuesday, January the 7th. Uh, 5.30 uh, in this room. Uh, I know also what this, uh, what is the, uh, the Wilmington Early College mid-year graduation? On the 14th. The 14th of uh, December is the uh, Wilmington Early College. Any other announcements, anything? All right, okay, uh, next item on the agenda, item 15. Uh, we'll need a motion to go in closed session pursuant North Carolina General Statute 143-318.11, A5, and 6. So moved. Second. Mr. Hayes, before you vote, uh, we need to add uh, an additional purpose, which will be a confidential student matter. Okay. But is that the same That's statute? That would be subsection 1. So it would be 1, 5, and 6. Okay, 1, 5, and 6. Do we have a motion? Was there a second? Yes. Okay. Uh, All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Thank you. We are in closed session. Hey, Mr. Hans, if Mr. Anderson, you'll join us.